Uh, my name is Carlton. Again, I always start by telling I'm a naturalist. And of course, a naturalist, somebody who studies, enjoys nature quite a bit. And from the turnout today, it looks like a lot of you are naturalists minded as well. I do live up in the Mills River area, up the mountain a little bit, but I love coming to Polk County. I had some relatives that used to live in uh, Polk County down, down uh, Basin Mountain. I used to come up here when I was a kid a lot, even though I was actually born and raised in Charlotte. Uh, used to come up here to Polk County, visit them a lot, and also in the Henderson County area. And of recent, I've been doing a lot of, well, not in the last couple of years, but before that, been doing a lot of fishing out at Lake Adger, and I just really like the Polk County area. So it's kind of a neat mix of the Piedmont and the mountains kind of rolled into one here at the base of the Blue Ridge Escarpment. So I love getting able to come down and visit this area here. So thanks for inviting me to come today. And I hope you can see the thing I'm going to show you here because the lights are kind of dim. I think we're making it nice for the owls. <laughs> I don't know if you can see me though, but in any case, maybe get a little more light and yeah, well, okay, there you go. <laughs> but uh, this program is today about owls. I call it Owls Masters of the Night. And pretty informal. If you have a question during the program, by all means, try to, I'll try to answer your question, but uh, I'll probably be answering a lot of your questions later on. You know, but if you have a question immediately, right, then I'll go ahead and ask if you like to. And then afterwards, I'll hang around for a little bit. Uh, there's some things you might look at here, pick up, that sort of thing. I'd be glad to talk to you afterwards. And we do have some live owls for you to visit with today. I brought two, two different species of owls here. I'm going to talk about all the different owls that actually make their home here in this area on a consistent year-round basis. And I'll mention a couple other species that might come in this area from time to time as visitors. Uh, and the, my, my kind of connection with owls is obviously as a naturalist you work with a lot of different animals and owls being one of those very mysterious animals that we get to work with. But also I get to work them a little closer than a lot of people because I also do some wildlife rehabilitation work. And I concentrate mostly on uh, birds of prey, which means hawks, owls, falcons, those types of birds like that. And some people throw in vultures with that as well. So I work with vultures as well. A few mammals, a lot of reptiles. Reptiles are one of my specialties as well. But I get to work with a lot of owls. And when you get to work with a lot of owls as a rehabilitator, you end up with some owls that can't be released for one reason or another. And those are the type of owls that we're busy with today. We'll talk about why they cannot be released. But that's part of the story of owls in general. But generally speaking, you know, uh, if I was to take a consensus vote here, sometimes I do, I won't do it today, but sometimes I'll actually have people in the audience raise their hand and say, how many of you ever actually seen an owl in the wild? And depending on whether you're an outdoor-related person or an indoor-related person or somewhere in between, usually about a third to a half of the group will raise their hand and say, yes, I've actually seen one in the wild. And other folks who are folks that are, would, like, would like to see one would recognize one if they saw it. But generally speaking, owls are kind of those mystery animals that a lot of people hear from time to time because they're vo vocal and they've seen a lot about them on TV, documentaries, and uh, that sort of thing. But when it comes down to actually experiencing an owl in a while, a lot of people have never seen one. And it makes them a very mysterious animal. So any animal that's very nocturnal like that is a little bit mysterious to us. But also an animal like an owl is especially mysterious because they have some very unusual life cycles and places they live. They're not the most common animal compared to some of the other creatures we see since they're a predatory animal and up near the top of the food chain. So owls generate interest with a lot of different people. So what I want to do today is introduce you to the different species of owls that are found in our area, intersperse that with a little bit, bit of a folklore maybe because owls do figure in folklore a good bit. Some people groups uh, let you see some live owls and talk a little bit about some of the life cycles of owls and maybe what you can do to go see one. So with that said, let's get started with a little journey into the world of owls. Now, uh, of the owl species that I brought here, I have some live ones, but also have some just pictures, okay? So the first one is a picture of an owl that's probably the most common owl that we have around this area. And I would have brought one of these today, but owls are one of those animals that are highly regulated and protected by law. And for the owls to come that you see here today, they have to go through a permitting process through the Fish and Wildlife Service. And uh, to uh, make a long story short, uh, I've got an owl that could have come visit today that was a screech owl, but I'm waiting on his permits to arrive in the mail. So legally, I couldn't bring him today, okay? But we can talk about it, okay? And this, this is an owl, not the smallest owl that's found in this region, but is one, one of the smallest. It's probably the owl that most people are most familiar with, and it's called a screech owl, okay? So raise your hand if you've heard of a screech owl. That's probably one of the most, more common types of owls around our area. Screech owls are about the size of my hand if I put my hand together like that and kind of scrunch it down. So a really big screech owl would cover up most of my hand there, but an average size screech owl, some of my hand might be uh, shading the, even the top of it. They're a little short owl, about maybe eight to 10 inches tall when they stretch out. And one of our smallest owls, they're 
found in our area. Now it's very unusual that they have a name screech owl because that's really not the sound they make. You know, and I'm not saying a screech owl can't make a screeching sound. They can, but it's usually one we hear in captivity under stress. It's not a call they would normally make in the wild. And I'll be uh, playing a few owl calls for us as well because one of the neat things about owls are the sounds that they make. And of course, like any other bird, you can identify their a call and tell what kind of a bird it is and that's important with owls because a lot of times you never get to see the actual bird. But screech owls are probably one of the best known owls in our area and because they're small they can live very very close to people whereas other owls have to have very large territories to find their food. Some owls that are smaller, that was not one of them, <laughs> can exploit small habitats close to people. So depending on where you live you may have a lot of these different owls all in the same area, but even if you live in a city area, you have just a few trees out back, a tiny little woodlot between houses in a neighborhood, chances are you have screech owls because they're very good at living in places, little what I might call pocket habitats where other people, uh, other types of owls may not live. So sometimes we come in contact with them. Now, screech owls come in two distinct color varieties, and a lot of the books you see on owls, they'll call them phases. And to me, a phase really, like, a, you know, you have a child, you're raising your child, it goes through that certain phase, and it goes to another phase, or we're on our certain phase, we go to another phase of life, you know, which means we change. But when you're a color phase of an owl, you don't change. You're, that's what color you are. But we have two basic color varieties, might be a better way of putting it. Screech owl, one's called the reddish phase, or reddish brown, and the other's called the gray phase. And depending on where you're at, one or the other could be most common, or from year to year it seems to change. In the same litter you might have one of each or two of each or whatever. So it, is, it doesn't seem to be any specific thing that guides that other than just genetics in a local area. Right now it seems like for the past few years most of the owls I get to see uh, as a wildlife rehabilitator, ones I observe in the wild, are mostly the reddish phase. But a number of years ago it seems like they were mostly the grayish color variety. So it just kind of goes back and forth. But a lot of people see these screech owls because they're small and they mistake them for great horned owl juveniles, baby great horned owls. And great horned owls are one of those uh, owls that are very recognizable because of feather tufts that stick up. And screech owls have that, but they're not baby great horned owls by any means. But we see them quite often. In fact, a lot of times owls hunt beside the highway for rodents and small insects and mice along roadside edges, particularly where a uh, highway cuts through a wooded area. And screech owls often wind up getting hit by cars. So, and you're driving down the road, a lot of times you're paying a lot of attention, you'll see a lot of little screech owls hit by cars, particularly in, in the winter or very early spring is the time that they seem to be hit by the most. And uh, a lot of times they're killed, but sometimes you'll come upon one that is injured and uh, might be able to be rehabilitated. So, uh, screech owls live very, very close to people. Now, we're gonna play the call of a screech owl. And just for fun, I want to, on the count of three, I want everybody to give me their best owl call imitation. What do you think, <laughs> maybe? That's pretty close. <laughs> For some owls. What do you think, what do you think a, the general call of an owl would be, okay? Uh, one, two, three. Okay. Everybody seems to think that owls all hoot. <laughs> I'm not saying that they, none do, some do. But do you know that a lot of owls don't hoot? Believe it or not, and screech owl is one of those. So let's listen to a little bit of a call of what a screech owl actually does sound like. See, it's really more like a mournful wailing call, kind of, and then sometimes backed up with a, a little trilling sound. It sounds something like some kind of an insect or frog or something like that. And sometimes that sound is not nearly as loud as you hear it on the tape there. You know, owls can amplify pretty well. Screech owls have this quiet little call that's quieter than it was on the tape there. And you'll hear it and you think it's something way off in the distance, but it's really close to you. And if the wind blows just a little bit, it muffles the sound, but it's very ventriloquistic. It, you think it's coming from much further away, but it's really very close. But it's a plaintive, kind of a quavering, whistling sound. And the Cherokee Indians in particular had a myth 
that they thought that this, uh, uh, they didn't, they, it's a myth obviously, but they believe it for sure, that when you heard a screech owl call like that, that was a bad omen, that somebody you knew was going to die. So, you know, if you were a Native American, you would not want to be hearing a screech owl call. But I've heard in other cultures that hearing something like an owl call is a good omen. So it depends on where you live and what you believe and all. But owl calls are very, very unique. Now, screech owls are what we call a cavity nester. And even though owls are highly protected by state and federal law, and you can't possess even a feather of one or a dead bird or definitely a live bird without a special permit, you can actually, there is a way for you to have your very own owl. You can make a screech owl nest box. I did bring some plans if you want to pick them up a little bit later if I have enough to go around. But this is a screech owl nest box. It's kind of like an overgrown uh, bluebird house, whereas a bluebird takes about an inch and a half entrance hole, a screech owl takes about a three inch entrance hole there and a much larger box. But certain owls are cavity nesters. Certain owls actually nest and build branch type nests, but some of them are cavity nesters. And screech owls are very effectively lured in nest where you want them to in your yard, where you can kind of claim them as long as you don't make a pet out of them and say they're your owls, even though they're really not, out in the wild. And a screech owl box like that is very, very effective. In fact, I know a couple of people have actually gone out, put up a screech owl box, the very next day had screech owls in it, or, or a couple other folks that actually were going out on a ladder, putting a screech owl box up, didn't finish the installation, came back the next day and screech owls had already moved in and it was sitting on top of the ladder. So <laughs> screech owl boxes really do work. There's a lot of other animals too, like squirrels, flying squirrels, and daytime gray squirrels, and uh, I've even had honeybees move into nests like, uh, nest boxes like that. So you never know who's going to get there first, but they are very, very effective. In a lot of areas, you might have abundant prey for owls, but you might not have enough nesting sites, and cavity nesters like that would appreciate you doing something like that. So screech owls, very, very common bird we have in our area. Now the next owl we're going to visit with is actually live and in person here, but we're going to show you a little picture of it to begin with here. And this next owl is one of my favorite of all the owls, simply because it's uh, has some, well, one thing it's pretty large, but it's not our largest owl, but it is also an owl that has a lot of interesting stories about it, makes some very interesting sounds, and it's pretty common depending on where you live. And it's called the barred owl. Okay? And I always give people a little spelling lesson when I give you that name because bard sounds a lot like another owl with a similar sound name, which we'll talk about in a moment. But bard is B-A-R-R-E-D. It's named for the pattern of the owl, little bars or little stripes. Some are vertical, some are horizontal. Uh, but it's kind of a gray and light gray colored owl. Great effective camouflage of the light and dark areas of this body matching the light and dark of the shade of the woods and the forest there with the furrowed bark and the limbs. And it's one of our more common owls. One of the few owls that you might actually hear calling during the daylight hours or maybe actually see moving around a little bit during the daylight hours. And it seems to be particularly common wherever we have wetlands that are associated with woods, particularly old growth forests, because they also nest in cavities. But it would be a much bigger cavity than a nest box like a screech owl. But there are plans over there if you want to try to build a barred owl nest box. Uh, you'll need a little help to get up in the tree, though. So it's much, much larger, but they are somewhat effective. But barred owls are pretty common throughout much of the eastern United States, but particularly in areas that have swamps and wetlands associated with uh, rivers and streams. And uh, the wetter, the better, because they can feed on a lot of different prey, including things like crayfish and salamanders and frogs, even though a lot of other owls, including them, the barred owl, will also eat a lot of rodents, rabbits, and warm-blooded prey as well. So they're a very common owl around our area. So we're going to take one out here and visit with it. And, and notice I'm putting on my protective gear here. And owls have some awesome weapons. And this bird we're going to look at, we'll talk about its story here in just a moment, but it's a pretty calm owl compared to the, this other one here. You can hear it hissing a little bit. doesn't seem very happy to be here. But barred owls have always been one of my favorites, and might be because one of the very first birds I ever had any kind of a contact with rehabilitating was a barred owl. And I've had a few interesting stories on the way about barred owls, so maybe I'll share one or two with you. Now, when I take my barred owl out, I'm going to quickly go over here for a moment because... <laughs> go ahead, do it and get it over with. <laughs> this owl loves to take a poop as soon as I take it out of the carrier. But you're not going to do it now. You're going to wait until I get on a nice hardwood floor, and then I'll have to clean it up. Right? Okay. Or maybe we get lucky, it won't do anything at all. <laughs> but this is a barred owl, and uh, you might wonder, well, does he have a name? Yeah, he has a name. His name is Harry. I'll tell you why that's 
He has the name Harry here in just a little bit because that kind of goes with his story. But barred owls, as I mentioned, are fairly common owls in a lot of areas. They're a pretty large owl, not our largest owl. By the way, males and females are a little bit different in size in all the owl species, including all the birds of prey. The birds of prey that are males are usually a little smaller than the females, but that's a relative thing. You see large female owls or small female owls. You see large males, small males. So it's a little hard to tell externally by looking at most owls whether they're a boy or a girl. We're assuming he's a boy, but we don't know 100% for sure. We can find out with a DNA test, but that involves drawing a little blood, and I've talked about that. He said no, <laughs> or she said no. Didn't care to do that. But in any case, uh, barred owls are pretty common birds, and they like that old growth forest because they are cavity nesters, but you can find them just about anywhere, uh, even close to people sometimes. And uh, once again, name for the barred pat. There we go. Just had to get that out of the way. <laughs> yep, yep. Well, I came prepared. I always bring my paper towels and stuff like that. So, we got a volunteer. You don't have to clean it up, just maybe cover it. Usually I just leave it, but people have a tendency to stare at it the whole time, and they're not looking at the owl. <laughs> Particularly when I'm doing a program with kids, it seems like the poop is more exciting than the owl. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> it kind of splattered a bit. Yeah, it does splatter a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> it's no big deal to me. This happens to me all the time. This might be ugh for you. I don't know. <laughs> but in any case, uh, barred owl is very, very interesting. Now, notice this owl does not have feathers, tufts that stick up, like the screech owl, or like his larger cousin, the great horned owl. They just have a rounded face, nothing sticking up there at all. But that's the gift. this is a great owl to look about and talk a little bit about general features of owls. Owls are very recognizable because they do have that rounded face. And the reason they have a rounded face and forward-facing eyes, first of all, they are a predatory bird, so they find their food. Most predators have their eyes fixed towards the front of the face. But the rounded face of an owl is an adaptation for actually not sight, but it's for hearing. And even though owls have a great sense of sight in dark areas, scientists claim that in pitch black, they don't see that well. But usually if you go out at night, even on a very dark night, if you let your eyes adjust, you can see a little bit. And you can see some starlight coming down, even water reflecting, uh, sun, uh, moonlight or starlight. Pretty, you know, there's very few nights where it's just so black you can't see anything. So an owl does have a very large eye where the pupil can, can cover the, uh, a whole eye when it opens up. So that does make them better uh, able to see in the dark than a lot of other creatures there. But also, they also find a lot of their food that they feed on in the dark by hearing, but, but not only by sight. And uh, some owls actually have very relatively small eyes in comparison, but the ones that have bigger eyes like this owl probably find their food more by sight than anything. But hearing is very important. And they have huge ears. Can everybody see the big ears on this owl? <laughs> not even in the front row, can you? No, not even in the front row. Because an owl's ears are hidden. But if you look at the rounded face of this owl, and right behind its eye, right here on the edge of the fringe of the facial is a big, large, crescent-shaped opening on the other side of the owl. Now, sometimes with a small group, I'll open the ear up and let you look in, but it'll probably uh, be a little bit hard to show everybody in a group this size. But I'm going to put my finger in here very gently and go up and down yeah. right here. And I'm, I'm actually touching the outside of the ear here. So uh, it's very large, crescent opening. One is a little higher than the other. It's a little asymmetrical. And the face acts like, well, if you remember the old days when we all had satellite dishes to get TV signals, the big giant. Satellite. Now we have these little ones, you know. But those pick up tiny little signals and funnel them down to the transmitter. Sounds in the forest are transmitted by a rounded face through the feathers down into those ear openings. And an owl like this can sense where something is coming from, a sound, even without seeing it. So they can focus on it, tilt their heads right and left, and then maybe fly in a little closer and find out where it is, and then maybe actually get a visual sighting. Or some owls that actually hunt and can find their food without ever actually seeing it can pounce on it just by hearing alone. So that's why an owl's face is rounded. And when an owl captures its food, it grabs it with its beak and holds on to it. But these are the weapons. That's why I'm wearing this big heavy glove. The talons or claws of an owl or a hawk or any other bird of prey, or we call them talons, are razor sharp. And an owl has very, very strong feet. So they grab their prey. They grab it with the beak, but they grab it with the feet first. They might break the spinal cord, and then they usually, if it's small enough, they swallow their food whole. Some larger owls may tear food up into small pieces, but most owls will swallow their food whole. And even though that doesn't look like their mouth is that big, once it opens up, it's a huge cavernous space there, and it's absolutely incredible the things that they can sometimes swallow in one piece. Yes? This bird 
never seems totally comfortable with you touching its face, its head. Yeah. Is that normal? Uh, well, of course not. <laughs> but this owl, this owl has been in captivity a couple years, and uh, see now it's saying, okay, I got to get out of here now. But uh, you know, this species of owl is a kind of a species that does better in captivity than some other species, so it's a little bit more likely that this is calm enough that I can do this kind of stuff, but also it has a little bit to do with the personality of the individual bird. But barred owls in general do pretty good in captivity as far as uh, calming down and that sort of thing. So, uh, but he lets me do that a little bit as long as I don't do too much of it, yes. So will an owl that size be able to prey on a full-grown chicken? A full-grown chicken it possibly could, but it probably would not be its number one prey. They almost always take things that are the most easily accessible to them, you know, so they're not going to hunt out something that is big just because it's good to eat, you know, when they bypass and lots of other smaller prey. So they're going to take the most easily accessible thing depending on the season of the year. But this type of bird will sometimes prey on smaller owls, particularly things like screech owls. So whenever you have a big owl around, uh, a little owl always has to be a little bit wary of being heard and seen. His wing is damaged. Uh, yeah, we're going to talk about his wing here in just a moment. But, you know, sometimes when people see an owl like this and say, well, it doesn't look that big. You know? But, you know, owls, when they spread their wings to fly, really do look huge. And this is a silhouette, a life-size silhouette of a barred owl right here, okay? So when they jump off their perch and fly and spread their wings, they're a whole lot bigger than you think. But they don't weigh as much as you think they do. Actually, a barred owl like this weighs, weighs mostly maybe two pounds, you know, sometimes a little bit less than that, whereas something like the screech owl we just saw, is literally just a few ounces in weight, much less than a pound, but even they have a very wide wingspan when they fly, so it makes them look a lot larger than sitting on a branch or something when you see them being very, very small. So, owls can kind of change their size depending on whether they're flying, pulling in their feathers, fluffing themselves out, whatever, and look very different, yes. Does his coloring change with the seasons? Uh, no, his coloring is pretty much the same. Yeah, sometimes when owls get a little bit older, they may darken up, but barred owls pretty much look a little bit, pretty much like the, you see it right here. Uh, do owls eat other birds? My, my question is, is if you have a plethora of small birds in your yard mm -hmm. regularly, is it a good idea to lure an owl? Well, it'd be hard to kind of lure an owl in, but uh, you know, if there's food there, an owl, find it, he might find it on his own. <laughs> but more likely, you're going to have other things like daytime sharp shin hawks, cooper's hawks, something like that feeding on uh, birds that come to a bird feeder. And owls like this, the birds that they would feed on mostly would be birds that are sitting on a perch at night, sitting in a tree, a bush, shrub, or something like that, where they just pick them off, and they're not going to catch them in flight or ambush them because the other birds are probably too quick to get away. So they just, you know, uh, opportunistic, but sneak up on it. And, you know, songbirds usually don't see very well at night. They're sitting on the branches, and if these guys can see them, it makes it easy prey for them. Yes? I'm just curious, why is this particular owl not being... Why can't you release it? Okay, well, okay, we'll talk about that then. Uh, yeah, yes? Does the asymmetrical ear placement have a purpose? Does it have a purpose? Yes. Because the sounds are out there, you know, things can be high or low. If your ears are kind of asymmetrical, you can kind of pinpoint more on the sound here and pinpoint here and actually draw coordinates in your mind as exactly where that sound is coming from. It's a very accurate way instead of having just perfectly symmetrical ears, believe it or not. Yes? Bones. Birds' bones are not completely hollow, but they have a lot of hollow spaces in them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we had a question here about this owl and why it's unreleasable to the wild. This owl was hunting, as I mentioned, like screech owls often do, that this owl also is a type that might hunt along the side of a highway. And this owl was in South Carolina a couple years back and was evidently hunting along the side of the highway. It must have swooped down to grab some prey, flew in the path of a car, and was, had a collision with a car. Somebody else came along and found this owl sitting in the road, unable to fly. Uh, scooped it up, put it in a cardboard box, came home, made some phone calls, found me, and uh, to make another long story short, this bird's wing tip was almost completely torn off uh, the, from the, feather, from the tip, tips of the, uh, what we would be analogous to our fingers. And uh, the veterinarian was able to stitch it back on, literally bandaged for about a month or so. It healed and actually took and stayed on there, but it doesn't have any flexibility. So this bird has been deemed unreleasable in a while simply because it can't fly as well as it should be able to to hunt and capture its prey. And even birds that have total flight ability, nothing wrong with them, often starve to death in the wild, simply because it's hard to live as a predator in the wild. So birds like this are kept in captivity 
always have something wrong with them. They're unreleasable because of an injury or something else that makes them unreleasable. Then they go through a permitting process with the Fish and Wildlife Service to, to be permitted to be used as education animals in captivity, but not as pets. Yes. So other than getting hit by a car, do owls have predators that Oh yeah, larger owls. And also an owl like this, as it gets older, you never see an old predator in the wild. Predators, as they get older, they slow down, they can't capture the food as much, they get a little weaker, then they may just die or something else suddenly can take advantage of that and prey on them. So a raccoon, bobcat, any number of things could kill an owl like this if he's not in prime condition. And obviously a bigger owl as well. Uh, if if y'all, it would it would probably be helpful as long as it's doesn't is not lighting somebody's eyes. You yeah, yeah. Drown. Yeah. Is that okay with everybody? What did yeah. you feed an owl in the wild? In okay. Captivity. Yeah, an owl like this in captivity. Sometimes we feed them mice, uh, but also there's there are captive diets made for owls and other birds of prey in captivity, which is owl eat some of that, but. I, Trying to mix it up with a variety of different things, but they're not fed live prey in captivity. They don't need to hunt in captivity. It was it's impractical to keep living things like that in captivity for them to feed on. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, you know, one of the interesting about barred owls, I think, are their calls. And I'm going to play a few calls at a barred owl, but a lot of people can identify the call of a barred owl simply because it almost sounds like somebody saying a, a human words, a phrase, who cooks for you, who cooks <laughs> for you all. So if you can remember that, there's no other how that quite has that rhythm to it. Who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? But who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? But they often change that up a little bit and just just do the last few syllables. Or they make monkey-like howls. And I've actually had people call me on the phone and want to know if monkeys live here in North Carolina. And no, they don't, but barred owls do. But they make a plethora of different calls that don't even sound like owl calls, don't sound like animal calls, don't even sound like humans. I always say if you're ever out in the wild and you hear a strange sound, blame it on a barred owl because it's probably one of the sounds that they make. In the dark, but they have been known to hunt during the daylight hours as well. Now that, we've got one more screech owl call to get out of there, I think, okay. And that's a screech owl finishing up, so we should have a barred owl call coming up. One more screech owl call. I think there's food over there, don't you? Okay. Now you're really confused, aren't you? This is also a call a screech owl can make, kind of a screeching sound, if you think you would hear from a screech owl, but <laughs> barred owl. Yeah. And also there's a sound that barred owls make, I always like to tell the story about one of the most frightening sounds a barred owl makes, and back in the 1970s it was a most memorable time for me when I was much younger and I spent a lot of time deer hunting in the mountains of West North Carolina, and I had a great place picked out on a low mountaintop ridge, it took a long time to get there. And, uh, but I was there early one morning, two hours before the sun came up, getting ready to hunt, walking through the forest, being quiet as I could, came through a thicket of mountain laurel that's evergreen during the month of November when the deer season began, sneaking around, making very little sound, and I walked out of this mountain laurel thicket and stopped underneath an oak tree. And unknown to me, there's a barred owl sitting on a low branch above my head. Instead of just sitting there and watching me and what, what, let me go by, or flying off, which I wouldn't have been able to see him in the darkness. He did what owls sometimes do in moments of distress. He let out a high pitch <laughs> scream at the top of his lungs. And if you've ever heard the sound of a barred owl screaming, you know it's very frightening, very blood curdling. And imagine that happening to you right above your head in the darkness with no warning whatsoever. One of the most frightening moments I've ever had in my entire life. I found myself face down on the ground, heart pounding into the frosty leaves. Head in the crook of my arm, 
but I had a good story to tell, but I actually scared the barred owl a lot worse. So many people have been frightened by the sounds these owls make. They can make some very unusual sounds, but normally you don't get too close to them like I did in that situation to have them scream at you unless you're a predator trying to grab them or something. But they're capable of a lot of very unusual sounds. By the way, before I put him up, you might notice now he's getting a little nervous. He's panting a little bit. That's why they cool off. They don't have sweat glands. But also, if I move my hand up and down, you notice his head kind of likes to stay relatively still. And also, when an owl turns his head, you may notice the eyes never turn of this owl. And of course, one of the questions I get about owls, how far can they turn their head? The answer is 270 degrees is the most thing to do it. Three-fourths of the turn. So if I wanted to show off and be an owl, I can show what an owl could do. I could turn my head completely around, look behind me, and keep on going, and look over there at the hornet's nest by going this direction. But it's in my experience, the owls seldom do that. They do often turn and look 180 degrees behind them. But sometimes they turn and twist around so it looks like the head spun 360 degrees. But their eyes never move. Their eyes are fixed in a socket. And they've got these huge eyes with no muscles left over in the skull space to move them around. So you can hold your head still and you can roll your eyes up, look left and right, and a lot of periphery vision. Owl can't do that. So if it has to look one inch anyway, half inch, up, down, whatever, his whole head has to go with it. The eyes are fixed into place. And, uh, but they've got great mobility, extra vertebrae in their neck there to be able to turn their head a lot more than most other animals can. He is looking at me because I'm the only human here that's going to bother him. You know, I mean, he, he doesn't like me. He doesn't like you. He's an owl. We're humans. But he knows you're not going to harm him. You're not going to touch him. You're not going to pull him out of that cage. You're not going to hoot at him. He knows smart enough that I'm the person that he has to worry about the most. So he watches me constantly. Not out of admiration. <laughs> because he is a wild owl. Just had to learn to be in captivity because of his unfortunate circumstances. But uh, I always say his bad fortunes are good luck. Allows us to see a bird like this up close in captivity and learn more about him and maybe pay attention a little bit more about the habitat we leave behind for owls in the wild. Maybe drive a little slower knowing that owls hunt along the side of the highway and just to appreciate those things that are out there we don't get to see very often. Yes. In the area I live, which is on the 12th Triangle, mm -hmm. we're heavily covered in woods up there. Uh -huh. And all this year, I'm up before dawn almost every day, and only in the last month or so have I started to hear these guys closer mm -hmm. and closer and closer to that whole area. Right, so, yeah. So, yeah. so is, there, is there a time of the year with their activity? There is a time of year, usually in the, in, in, uh, with this type of owl, February and March, we hear increased calls. These owls, that's their breeding season. So, but at any time of year, particularly this time of year, it could be established their territories that you're starting to hear call a little bit more than usual. But uh, the best time to hear owls are usually during the breeding season. But that varies with different kinds of owls. So there's another owl we're going to meet here in just a moment. Actually, the breeding season is coming up really close now and going around November and December is a good time to hear them. But this owl is mostly heard breeding calls in the February and March is the best time to hear them. Uh, they can breed in captivity, but usually don't. They have to have specialized conditions usually to, to do that. Uh, have there been studies of, 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 of what? Uh, the, well, you hear about the wise old owl. Uh, that's simply not true. <laughs> they're, they're, they're smart birds, but no smart anything other bird. If you listen, he's smart enough to sound like a duck, though. <laughs> They make a lot of unusual sounds. That's kind of a stress relief thing. But you're, you know, owls are not any smarter than any other bird out there. In fact, they're probably dumber than some as far as intelligence goes compared to something like a parrot or a bird like that. How about compared to a crow? Uh, nothing smarter than a crow. <laughs> Birds are, crows are extremely intelligent. So intelligence-wise, I'd rate the crow much higher than an owl. Uh, it's just si simply a territorial type mating call. Just who cooks for you? Who cooks for you all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah please. Yeah. How long did it take after he was brought in that you could start him? Uh, it took a while for him to heal up, and all. It took a few months for that. But once I actually started working with him, he he made a quick adjustment in just a few weeks to be able to use be used to, you know the glove. But then I had to slowly introduce him to people along the way. So that took a little bit long. Some, some of it took longer. So. Okay, moving right along here. Uh, the next bird we want to talk about is also a bird we're going to get a chance to visit with here. And this might be the 
most exciting bird to see, to depend on what you think of these birds. And this is one called the, your time is over, hush. <laughs> called the great horned owl. Great horned owl. And great horned owls are pretty common birds too. They're maybe actually more common in their distribution in North America than a barred owl, which is mostly in the Midwest, Eastern United States, but they are actually expanding the range. But great horned owls have been found in every state of the United States. So they're pretty widespread. Not in every single habitat, but they are widespread found in every state. Great horned owls are our largest native owl we have in this area. Adult females sometimes weigh in as much as four pounds. Uh, more average male might be two and a half to three pounds, or female three, half, something like that. But they're much heavier than these birds, but still they're pretty lightweight when you compare how big they actually are. And great horned owls have a very wide wingspan. So this wingspan can be approaching five feet for a great horned owl. Okay. And great horned owls are pretty common in our area here, particularly anywhere we have the proper which is mostly deep woods. Have a tendency to hunt a lot along pasture edges where you keep livestock, uh, where you agricultural areas where you have fields and pasture meat and wood lots, that sort of thing. So, uh, but they're they're found in a lot of different situations. But one of the more common birds I know where I live up in the Mills River area, but they're pretty common in a lot of other areas as well. So uh, we'll take out a great horn out here. A little bit rather. This is a female. Female horns out are pretty noticeably bigger than the males. But once again, they look the same. And where I've had the uh, barred owl, we just saw Harry, which was nicknamed Harry because the guy who brought him to me and found him, he just thought he looked like a Harry. So I kept him. You know, that doesn't sound like a great owl name, but it's fine. Uh, this bird I've had for about 16 years. And you would never believe that I've had this bird as long, this long because this bird kisses at me, at me, hates me, despises me every single day, even though basically I helped save its life <laughs> and brought it back to help and feed and take care of it every day. Birds are wild creatures. They don't understand that sort of thing. So this is a great horn <laughs> out. Yeah. No affection there whatsoever. Great horned owl. Okay, so we're going to let our great horned owl sit there because this owl likes to sit on a perch much better than my hand. And we're going to clip her in and we'll talk a little bit about great horned owls. Now great horned owls are very, very strong owls. In fact, they're sometimes referred to as tigers of the night is a nickname. And they do look like a tiger-like animal. I mean, those big yellow eyes staring at you, the colors they have. But mostly they're just a very, very powerful bird. Their feet are like bear traps. Their talons are long. They have ta sharp talons, needle sharp talons. The talons are as big as you'd find on a 90, 100 pound dog with a bear trap uh, ability to grab something. Something that goes in the talons of a great horned owl don't come out again unless the great horned owl releases its grip. In fact, the great horned owl, if it tried hard enough, it could actually go through this glove here. So when we get them in for rehabilitation, we have to be very, very careful with them because the talons are very, very deadly weapons. Uh, and they use them for defense as well. But you notice a great horned owl has a great name. It is named for the feathers that stick up. They're not horns and they're not ears. You notice that this owl is ticked off at me right now and, and they're laid back. And I, I think that's a little bit like a dog. You ever see a dog that has his ears laid back? You don't go pet a dog that has his ears laid back. You know, that's a sign like, I'm going to bite you or something. But if a dog is very alert or happy, the ears go up, listen, that sort of thing. So right now this owl is ticked off. It may be this entire time. But luckily I can come kind of manipulate them a little bit here. So give you what they look like when they're at a more of a more of an alert stat, status there. But it's a great name, great horned owls. But we really don't know what the purpose of those so-called horns are. They're just feathers. They don't have anything to do with the hearing. They probably help break up the outline of the owl somewhat because any angular part of the body that doesn't look totally rounded or square is going to be something else going to blend you into your background. And the colors of this owl, of course, help blend it in very well as also. But also it is a little bit of a mood indicator there as well. But there's a fancy name for those feather tufts. They're actually called plumicorns. So if you want to add vocabulary and use a word that nobody else has heard of and probably you won't ever use again, plumicorns. Plumicorns are the feather tufts that stick up on a great horned owl. <laughs>
Now, we're going to hear the calls of the great horned owl. Then I'll tell you a little bit about the story of this owl and why it's in captivity, because it is also unreleasable. Meanwhile, she's doing a little bit of, maybe we can get a little demonstration of the neck turning ability here, head turning. There we go, 180 degrees. Oh, there we go. So once they get to the 180 degree spot, they usually turn it back the other way. If they wanted to show off, they could go another 90 degrees. So you're smart enough, you don't need to show off, right? There you go. <laughs> be nice if you face the audience. Yes. <laughs> okay. So we heard that shooting sound. That that's the great horned owl. And they start calling a lot in November. About the time we get to Thanksgiving, they're actually pairing up for the year. They don't already have a mate from last year. Calling, they're actually laying eggs by the first part of the year in January. By the end of January, come Groundhog Day, their eggs are probably hatched. They're on the nest, and by the way, their nest is, it can be a hollow tree cavity, but normally not a hole in a tree. It might be a broken off snag, but a lot of times they make a nest out of an old squirrel's nest or an old red-tailed hawk nest, maybe bring in a few extra sticks, so it's usually an open nest, which is kind of unusual for a bird that actually lays its eggs and starts to raise it young in the middle of the winter, but they get an early start because they have a very long developmental period, and the babies are not actually able to fly and fledge and be totally on their own until mid to late summer. So there's a lot of great horned owls are just now getting rid of their kids, you know, and they may be still in the same habitat. The young birds, uh, once they get off the nest, they are not small like a screech owl, so you never will mistake them for a baby uh, screech owl for a, a baby great horned owl. The babies are huge, and when they leave the nest, they're, they're already the size of the adults and have the adult coloration there. But sometimes we find them uh, on the ground in uh, March of the year, a lot of times when baby great horned owls get big enough to start moving around, they have a tendency to, to fall out of the nest or a windstorm may come along and you may find a big fluffy white owl on the ground that's not ready to fly yet. Usually the parents continue to take care of the owls on the, on the ground so you probably shouldn't pick up and try to help an owl like that. And a lot of times they get pushed out of nests a little bit before they're actually able to fly anyway. So the, but the, the parents are there, they're taking care of them, a mother and a father, and we no, normally don't need to step in and help. But the babies do follow the parents through the woods throughout the summer, and they have these sometimes begging cries that they, that they do to, to the, to the um, uh, parents, begging for food. And we hear some of these sounds, sometimes we wonder what they are. And a lot of begging cries sound a little different if so it aren't tape here. But they make other sounds that don't sound like the hooting sound. So you wouldn't know exactly what kind of a sound that you're hearing. So you could easily mistake it for something else. Yes? Owls migrate at all? Most owls do not migrate, with the exception of a couple we'll talk about towards the end of the program here. But for the most part, the owls you see at any time of year, they're there year round. They may move around within their habitat looking for different food sources, but they usually don't migrate out you know, dozens or hundreds or even thousands of miles like other birds often do. Now, this owl, we call her uh, Owl Vira. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, like I said, I've had her about 16 years, but she has a story that is very similar to a lot of other owls I've had to work with. And we see this more in this type of owl than others, but it can happen with any bird. But this owl was found tangled in a barbed wire fence. And when I see barbed wire fences, I've always hated barbed wire fences. When I was a kid, running through the woods, I was always getting snagged in a barbed wire fence. Wherever I want to go, I had to climb over a barbed wire fence or under one, you know. But barbed wire fences are terrible things to have if you enjoy wildlife because they don't know what they are. And wherever you have fields and pasture where you have barbed wire fences, the cattle, horses, whatever, don't graze as close to the barbed wire. Probably the grass and brush grows up a little bit. Provides a little travel lane for different animals to travel from one part of the forest to another, particularly across an open area like a pasture or field. But it provides a great hunting place for an owl like this to find its food. So they zero in on those spots. They come swooping down. Last thing they do with their wings spread out like that, pulling their talons forward to grab their prey. And as they stop and swing down to pick up their prey, the wing gets snagged in a barbed wire fence, and it's a very common injury to find bar, uh, uh, owls with wing injuries. Sometimes these wing injuries we see are from getting hit by cars along the highway, but a lot of them are snags wounds from getting snagged on a barbed wire fence. 
And that's particularly bad because if, if they get on there very tightly, they'll twist and they'll turn, and sometimes they've been known to actually wrench their wing completely off trying to get off the fence. Otherwise, they may be found hanging there for days until they die of dehydration or starvation or another predator comes along and finishes them off. That's what happened with this owl. It was found hanging from a barbed wire fence, very emaciated, very weak. Somebody brought me the owl plus the barbed wire fence, still embedded. And uh, it took about six months for the wound to heal. The injury was so bad, it, it went down. You could see tendons, the bone, big open wound in the joint, which is one of the worst places for a bird to have an injury because that wing joint is never going to be the same. So this owl has a lot of trouble flying at all even to this day. Uh, and for many years, the wing actually drooped down. It's not as droop as it used to be. But this owl is definitely unreleasable to a while. But that happens quite often. Barbed wires, fences are terrible things. And I always say we can't do much about our highways other than slow down a little bit and knowing that animals are there. But we can do something about barbed wire fences. There are other alternative type fences. But barbed wire may be cheap. But please, if you have fencing, you know, don't put it up. Use something else instead of barbed wire. Okay, good. In a captivity, great horn owls have one of the longevity records. They might be able to live 25, 30 years in captivity. And I don't know how old this bird was when I first got it, uh, but I've had it for 16 years, you know, so it could, easily could be 20 years. It could have another 5, 10, 15 years ago, if, for all we know. But they are one of the longer lived birds of prey in captivity. But none of these birds would live anywhere near that in the wild because once you get old as a predator, you get weak. So maybe 10 years or so in a while might be a little bit more average, something like a great horned owl. Yeah. Any more questions about owl vira? <laughs> we, we've got a lot of coyotes that have recently moved into our area. Mm -hmm. um, also, we've had a lot of barn owls based on the calls. Mm -hmm. What's the impact of more and more coyotes coming into our area on uh, probably not much because you know these birds nest high off the ground. The coyotes aren't going to be able to feed on the babies or anything like that. They might find an occasional chick that's fallen out of the nest, something like that, you know. And uh, but uh, these birds are pretty powerful prey, and a very young coyote pup could be food for a great horned owl. In fact, in our area here, great horned owls routinely feed their favorite prey are skunks. Skunks. You say, well, how could they eat a skunk? Well, number one. Skunks are real easy to see in the dark. The black part's not, but the white part is, okay? And anything the size of a skunk is prey, which means that your cat that you let roam at, at night could become great horned owl prey. But owls, do, like most birds, do not have a sense of smell. So if a skunk sprays, they don't smell it. So evidently skunks smell bad, but they taste good if you can't smell. So hold your nose if you ever have to eat one. But in any case, uh, I get a lot of uh, owls in there that are injured for some reason, and they almost always smell a skunk. That's one of their favorite prey items. But anything that size they can feed on, but they'll feed on smaller items as well, but they have a tendency to eat the bigger items, which brings to mind something that all owls do when they eat something. Of course, when you digest something, you've got to use the bathroom, right? Okay. But with owls, they do something very interesting. They actually cough up the indigestible portions of their food in what's known as an owl pellet. And Owl pellet looks like this. Now, if you saw a pile of these on the ground, it might be dog poop. But <laughs> you find one or two, and it's dry and it does, doesn't smell bad, it's probably an owl pellet, particularly you see little bone bits sticking out of it. But a pellet doesn't come out of this end. A pellet comes out of this end. So all the indigestible portions, fur, feathers, bone, whatever, comes out in a little compact pellet, and it's coughed up once or twice a day by an owl, okay? And we'll find these where owls roost, and they're often collected and, and sterilized and sold to science supply houses where they're sold to science classes. Some of you might have dissected an owl, or some of these folks might be going to school at some point in time here might be dissecting an owl pellet. And if you haven't dissected an owl pellet, as an adult, you should dissect an owl pellet. Because scientists do it to find out about all the small prey items that live in an area they sometimes couldn't find otherwise, and we know what owls eat because of that. But an owl like this that eats large prey items is not going to eat the bones very often. They're going to eat the meat. So they won't cough up as much pellets, depending on what they're feeding on. They're feeding on small mice and rodents, and they're eating the whole animal. You get into bones and fur, yeah, you'll find pellets. But an animal like this that might eat a skunk is going to rip the meat off of it and eat the meat. And there'll be very little bony material there. Maybe get a little fur in there, so you might not see as many pellets like from a great horned owl as some other species. But you might, depending on what they're feeding on. 
interesting about owls. And I do have some owl pellets of different species you can look at here at the end of the program uh, before I leave if you'd like to. So what time of day do they primarily hunt their prey? Uh, these are pretty much nighttime hunters. You know, usually about dusk they get active, but you might find any owl active at any time of day if they're not finding enough food to feed on, but very seldom do they hunt during the daytime. Yeah. Yes? So if I was to find an owl in this dress, uh, you notify somebody like me, but also somebody like me is sometimes hard to find unless you, you know, have my specific phone number or something like that. But if, if you're ever out and you find an injured bird of prey uh, and you think it needs help, call somewhere like a nature center. Call a zoo. Call even a veterinarian. A lot of times you can call the local sheriff's department or something, somebody like that, and they will know who to call. But usually a nature center zoo, veterinarian will have a list of wildlife rehabilitators that are in a given area. And also, if you can't do that, you can also always go to the website of the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission, which is ncwildlife.org, and you can find a wildlife rehabilitator on the website county by county. But just be aware that not all of them work with birds of prey. A lot of them work with other animals, and you have to have certain permits for certain ones. So some, there are some counties that don't have any licensed wildlife rehabilitators in them. So sometimes you have to get help from several counties away. But a lot of times if you can get a bird in a box or something safely by putting a blanket around it or something, uh, and then you can transport it to somebody. Sometimes a wildlife officer in your area will transport something like that to a wildlife rehabilitator nearby. So uh, you just, just think of all the animal related things in your mind and then call one of those places. They should be able to eventually lead you to a wildlife rehabilitator. Uh, so the West North Carolina Nature Center is a great resource. Uh, if you just call them, you should be able to set you up with somebody. Then there's always a Carolina Raptor Center in Charlotte, uh, which specializes in bird to prey rescue as well. Yes? Oh, wow, look at that. Okay, make sure everybody takes a look at that for you. Yeah, yeah, very good. Okay, well, we're going to leave our great horned owl out there as a little ornament while we talk about a couple other owls in our area. So those are the two live owls that we're going to visit with, but we want to talk about a couple of owls as well that I don't have live in person to show you here. And because you're in the area you're at here, this is kind of a unique area. Around here you have a lot of pastures, you have a lot of open areas, barns, that sort of stuff. You know, some of you may horse, have horses, that sort of thing. But this area in particular and other areas that are this kind of open country with some mixed woodlots, you would have this other species of an owl called a barn owl. And then I said barred owl before with a B-A-R-R-E-D. This is the one that a lot of people mistake it for, the barn owl, B-A-R-N, like the barn where you put your supplies in, you know, horses, cows, hay bales, that kind of stuff. So there actually is a barn owl. But notice it's a very different looking owl. White face, white underparts, the top of the owl is pretty much cinnamon brown, salt and pepper speckled color. When this bird flies overhead, it looks like an all white owl, but it's not. It's only half white, and that's the underneath that you're seeing. But barn owls, like their name implies, they actually do roost in old barns. And for many, many centuries, they've been associated living close to people, particularly agricultural areas that have old buildings like barns or any other old building will do as long as it's not used very much, has an out-of-the-way place, a loft or something where they can go and hide during the daytime, raise their young in there, have a sheltering roost during the daytime, and then fly out in the evening. They like to hunt grasslands, pasture lands for rodents that are called voles, which are a, is a certain kind of a mouse that lives in our area that has furry ears, a short tail, and they live out in fields and pastures, and uh, that's their primary food. But barn owls will eat shrews, they'll eat moles, they catch, occasionally come to the surface, small birds they might catch, anything they can catch. But they're one of the owls that has small eyes and hunt primarily by sound. And they will actually fly low over the field and hover, listening with their face, drop down in tall grass and come up with a vole or some other small animal. So they're a very, very efficient hunter. But barn owls are pretty interesting. Also, barn owls, when you see pellets like I just showed you, uh, those are barn owl pellets usually because they're found routinely where they roost. And if you find a pellet out in the wild underneath the tree, you're lucky because they disintegrate so quickly in the weather out there. But inside of a building where the barn owls will roost, they cough up their pellets there day after day after day. They're inside of a building. They dry out and they're preserved and you can go and collect sometimes dozens of them at a time, fill up a bucket full of them if you have a barn owl population. So that's where most supply houses get their pellets are mostly from barn owls. Now I'm gonna play a few barn owl calls because uh, if you ever go to an old building where barn owls roost, you may back away, you might be frightened because you might think you found a haunted house. 
because barn owls are noted for some odd sounds they make. Whereas the barred owl hoots, and this guy makes some hooting sounds, uh, and the screech owl makes his other sounds we heard, the barn owl makes very different sounds. None of them are hoots, but they're very, very odd. Screams, screeches, wails, and hisses. That's a barn owl. Imagine walking into a dark barn and hearing that come from the dark You're seeing an owl that looks all white come flying out across the darkness because it's a ghost, you know. The babies are especially known for hissing. If you approach your nest, these little white downy babies will rise about a dark and they'll undulate like serpents. And they hiss with an incredibly loud hissing sound. You swear to the nest of snakes, you know. People are very frightened when they hear barn owl sounds in these old buildings, barns. And that gives rise to the fact that a lot of people think that those areas are haunted. So a haunted house might be inhabited, not by ghosts, but by barn owls. And I used to have some barn owls. They passed away of old age now, but I love to have them on program because they're such a beautiful bird, and maybe I'll have one again in the future. But they're not as common uh, as far as we have birds. And all the ones I've gotten in the last few years have unfortunately not made it. They've been too late to save and all. But uh, I used to have a pair and I can only imagine somebody walking by my place the sounds they heard because I would hear these odd sounds coming from the back of my house and when the enclosure was, they screeched, things sound like cars screeching their brakes to a stop and screams and wails, you know, just very odd. So barn owls are pretty cool. But there is another little owl here that we want to mention that you won't find down here around Polk County. You're going to have to go up in the mountains a little bit higher. And if you go to the very highest mountain elevations here, you might see this next owl, which is an owl a lot of people have no idea lives here. It's our smallest owl. It's even smaller than a screech owl. So maybe about two-thirds of the size of a screech owl, but with a big, broad, wide head, bright yellow eyes, kind of like this, but with a totally rounded head, no horns, is our sawwet owl. <laughs> sawwet owl, which has an interesting name. And you might wonder, why would you call it a sawwet owl? Well, these guys, in a moment, but these owls are high mountain elevations. They're actually more Canadian than northeast United States. But, of course, if you know anything about western North Carolina and the mountains that we have here, that's like an extension of the northeast. So you find a lot of interesting things at the highest elevations that would be at home further north in southern Canada or the northeast United States. And screech owls, I mean, uh, sawwet owls are somewhat migratory, so they're not there all the time. And they may migrate actually to coastal areas and other areas a little farther east and, and lower elevation and turn up in places uh, uh, in the wintertime. But they're definitely their breeding place here in North Carolina. Uh, the southernmost part of their breeding range is the high mountain elevations uh, usually above 4,000 to 5,000 feet, where the spruce fir forest of the high mountains meets the northern hardwood zone between about four and 5,000 feet. But they're not real common there, but they definitely are there. But they get their name Sawwet Owl from the fact that long ago when early settlers came to our area, and uh, I'm not that old, but I remember one of these things. Uh, oh, I remember seeing it in, in one of my uh, grandparents' yards. Something. It was a big old structure that had pedals on it. And you could sit on it and you turn a wheel that had an axle there by pedal power. And you're turning this big stone, a grinding stone that you could sharpen axes on. And that's something that the early settlers used to have all the time before we had electric power. They made this big grinding stone to sharpen their saws and axes. And when it turned on its axle, all like that as it went around, a very repetitive squeaking sound. And that's what the sound of this bird sounds like. Not hoots, not screams, not screeches, a kind of a tooting, whistling sound, repetitive over and over and over, much like a squeaky wheel turning. Somebody oil that axle. <laughs> that didn't do any good. More grease. <laughs> so that's one of those birds that has a cultural connection to its name. Saw wet because it's sharpening the saw, the wet stone. That's what we sharpen things. It's called a wet stone, saw wet owl. So if you're lucky when you had a high elevation, you might run into one of those at some point in time. And to finish up here, I'm going to mention a, a couple of other owls. You know, most of the owls, really, there's only like about five species of owls that routinely are found here in this area, year-round. The barn owl, great horned owl, screech owl, saw wet owl, barred owl. 
you know, compared to all the other birds that are found here, it's a really a small group, you know, but we're talking pr about predatory birds too, because there's less of them. But there are occasionally a couple of other owl species, actually three, that might turn up here in western North Carolina or any part of North Carolina or some areas of the southeast at other times. Most of our birds are not migratory as far as the owls are. A lot of our daytime diurnal raptors are migratory, but very few of our owl species are. But there are some northern species of owls that occasionally will come further south here. And one species is called the long-eared owl. It has been spotted in North Carolina before. There's a little bit of speculation that it might even be a little nesting here in some of the mountain areas or somewhere a little bit north. It's not been proven yet, it's just speculated. But a long-eared owl, which I don't have a picture of, looks a lot like a great horned owl, slimmer and smaller, but with much longer feather tufts sticking way up high. So they're pretty, but they look more like a great horned owl than anything, but smaller. So they have been documented here, being a northern owl that sometimes comes further south particularly if they have a bad winter up north, prey items are hard to find, a lot of snow, drop in rodent populations. Some northern species of owls have been known to filter down and come as far south as North Carolina even further in the winter time for a very short period of time. Also another owl called the short-eared owl. I'd also have a picture of it, but you can imagine it looks a little bit like a long-eared owl or something like that, but which very short feather tufts and a lot smaller, just a little small owl, has also been found here occasionally in the winter time. Uh, but very rarely, so, and even into South Carolina, they've had a few reports of them, but that's a, on a very rare occasion, so they're not considered part of our normal owl population. And then there's one other owl species that has been spotted in North Carolina, very even more rarely than the other two I mentioned, but last year was a year when you could have spotted one, because we had a very unusual year last year with this creature called the snowy owl. Okay, and uh, snowy owls live up around the Arctic. They are like our far northern bird that nest in the Arctic, and they're about the size of that. Uh, a typical is six pounds, there, whereas a big horn owl might weigh about four pounds. But a more likely, you know, three to four, four, four and a half to five pounds or so, something like that, but pretty close to the size of a great horned owl. But the males being mostly solid white, females having a lot of barring on their feathers. The immatures have a lot of barring here too. So the immature females and males look very similar. But last winter, uh, some of you may have, may have known, uh, we had a very unusual year, and, uh, and, but you may not know why. But we had several snowy owls that were actually spotted in North Carolina. And there was one snowy owl wound up one or two on the island of Bermuda in the Atlantic Ocean. We had one that flew all the way to Jacksonville, Florida. And almost every state in the eastern seaboard had sightings of these uh, snowy owls. Well, what happens is snowy owls live in the Arctic. They nest there in the tundra habitat on the ground, no trees there. And in the wintertime, when the going gets really tough and the cold weather, the winds, the snow, that sort of stuff, some of the immature birds that aren't quite the good hunters that they need to be to survive, some of them may fly a little further south and they might wind up around the southern Canadian border and a few are spotted there routinely in the winter. In some winters, a few will be spotted in a few areas of the northeast United States, like you know, around uh, Massachusetts or Maine or somewhere like that, just a handful here and there, and it creates quite a stir whenever they're seen. Every once in a while, one will come down and uh, be as far north, um, far south as something like Virginia or something. Actually, one was spotted in North Carolina and documented back in 1891 in the Weaverville area near Asheville, but until then, we don't know of any documented sightings until last year. And then suddenly last year, dozens of snowy owls started showing up further south of Canada. There was as many as 100 or more around the Boston airport, big grassy open areas that resembled tundra habitat. That's where they would be found. All these states started reporting sightings. Not, I'm not, not like they're everywhere. I mean, a few here and there, but one spot is incredible. Uh, so what happened is there was a lot of immature snowy owls that survived last year. Most of these that flew south were immature birds. And researchers that had been studying snowy owls, particularly up in the Quebec area, had taken some photographs of some of the nests there. And whereas these birds nest on the ground and they have maybe like three or four eggs or so, and they're lucky to have one snowy owl chick survive to fledge and fly, they all survived almost all last year. And the reason was they said they had an absurd number of rodent prey available. Ab you know, scientists are usually use more specific terms. Absurd is not a scientific term, but that's, that's what they use. You know, for scientists to say that, that's like unbelievable. And that one picture that was widely in, uh, distributed around on the internet through some sites and all, showed a snowy owl nest 
eggs sitting in on the ground, about three or four eggs or so, sitting on the ground, not even hatched yet, and lined up around like you would pile up rocks for a campfire ring or something. Piles of dead rodents, lemmings mostly, and voles. Piled up, waiting. There was a, one photograph had 70, I think, lemmings or something like that, about a dozen voles, and the eggs hadn't even hatched yet. The parents says, all this food, Come on, let's do it. <laughs> so we had an unprecedented number of babies surviving because they had one of these psychic populations that may never happen again with a rodent population. So the, a lot of the immature birds that came south, instead of having just a few, they had bunches of them. At one time, there were at least six in North Carolina, mostly down on the coast of North Carolina, and one, the one you look at a picture of here, actually turned up here in western North Carolina in the uh, city of, I won't say city, it's a town of Rosman down below Brevard, up in the mountains, not too far from where I live, and uh, it created, created quite a stir, uh, because now we have the internet, we have people birding as a hobby. When a white owl is seen hanging around an area, it gets your attention in the middle of winter. You know, no, no leaves, not hiding in the woods, out there in open country, sitting on the ground, pasture land. That's where this owl was spotted. So uh, people came from several states away to try to add it to their uh, life list, you know, uh, literally, and it would make quite the internet sensation. And, and unfortunately, this bird became very weak. I got to see it in the wild uh, this, one Sunday in early December. And the next day, I was called in to rescue it. I'd seen it flying around, but it seemed a little weak. And sometimes birds at that time of year, even our local birds, young birds that were fledged from the year before, have trouble finding enough prey in the middle of the winter, and they succumb to malnutrition and, and uh, starvation. So this bird was starting to get weak, and it got to the point where it could no, no longer fly. And luckily, I was able to be called in to rescue it. And it's, it was uh, probably not to survive more than a few more days in a while because it was very, very weak, lost half of its body weight, had a high white blood cell count. Whereas a lot of the other snowy owls in other areas actually were in pretty good shape. They actually were able to capture some, put radio transmitters on them to try to study their movements in the winter time and uh, track them as they flew back north. A lot of them did not survive their trek to the south though, but when this bird was rescued, at least six others were in North Carolina, mostly down around the Outer Banks and Outer Piedmont area. Another bird was found in in the Kentucky area in the same condition this bird was. It did not survive, uh, did, did, did die in captivity, rehabilitation facility there. But I took in this bird and, and kept it for a few months. A lot, a lot of uh, uh, work with it, bring it back to health. And uh, it's putting its weight back home, finally got its white blood cell back, count back to down to normal. We're looking about a 30 minute, uh, th 30 day release window when we could probably get this bird back out in a while, but we we're planning on maybe taking it all the way to Maine or Southern Canadian border and releasing it there, fly the last thousand mile journey, hopefully back home. But then something happened, uh, we don't know what happened, but it might have had a reaction to the medications it was on, but it suddenly had a withered toe that lost its circulation to it. And the toe, despite surgery, ended up having to be amputated, which means it lost one of its weapons. And then on another foot, the same thing happened with another toe. It had to be amputated and it lost its weapon. And before that, it actually lost permanently another talon and a talon bone on another foot. So it had three weapons out of its eight weapons gone. That's too much of a disability when you have to make your living killing things with your feet. So. At the last moment, this bird became unreleasable, and uh, now I'm working with it in hopes that we can glove train it, and it's been permitted already by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, so that hopefully maybe one day I'll be able to stick a snowy owl on a branch up here, and people can see uh, not only a great horned owl, but its far northern cousin, the snowy owl as well. So that's, that's been a real neat thing, and every, we nicknamed this bird Tundra, and it's created quite a stir because being the fact that snowy owls are normally very rare this far south, but last year was a year of the snowy owl, but it may never, ever happen again. And probably will be the last snowy owl I'll ever get a chance to work, unless I move to Alaska. <laughs> yes, yeah, so if you read about a snowy owl in western North Carolina, that's it. Okay, so, so that's, that's it, I'll kind of wind things up here.